Hello, this is Keith Larson, editor of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com. Welcome to this Solutions Spotlight episode of our Control Amplified podcast, sponsored today by Griffin Open Systems. With me today is Brad Radel, one of the automation industry veterans who in 2013 co-founded Griffin Open Systems to bring to market a graphical programming toolkit for rapid application development and deployment of real-time solutions. Welcome, Brad. It's a real pleasure to talk with you today. Well, good morning, Keith. Thank you very much for the invite and opportunity to chat with you. Well, back in 2013, eight years ago, but when you first started the company, data analytics, AI, and industry 4.0 were really just starting to get recognized as that new set of tools and models that would maybe allow the process industries to reach new levels of productivity, reliability, and efficiency. But that digital transformation hasn't always gone, or should I say, as smoothly as some of the pundits predicted. Were they wrong, or what has stood in the way of broader adoption and success in the digital transformation arena in the process industry? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I've been working in this industry space for many uh, years. I think the term was used experienced since the early 90s utilizing uh, neural nets. Mm -hmm. The challenges we've seen through the years is that there's been a heavy uh, focus on, say, the algorithms themselves and what they can do. And uh, they sort of neglected operators and what it would take to have acceptance by them, engineers, how best to incorporate their process knowledge into the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, also just recognizing the limitations of a, uh, you know, a given algorithm. You know, a algorithm needs to be fitted to the problem and not trying to, you know, cram your problem into the algorithm. So there's been a lot of limitations built into those uh, tool sets as they have been developed through the years. And ultimately, for the technology to be successful, you need to be looking at minimizing the dollars. You need to minimize the time spent to support those solutions. And, uh, you know, ultimately, almost always the best technology is that which is the simplest. Mm -hmm. Maybe complex behind the scenes, but is simple for the users to, to maintain and, and utilize. Yeah, that makes a lot of a lot, a lot of sense. Griffin offers what you've described as kind of a, a system agnostic fourth generation AI toolkit for implementing real time optimization strategies, sitting just above the the world of DCS and PLCs and also interfaces with other enterprise systems. Certainly reminds me a lot of the previous generation of model based advanced control packages that required a lot of domain expertise to, to set up and even more care and effort and attention when it came to maintaining those models. Often they were turned off and not used because they were out of, out of sync with the actual process. How is the Griffin approach different than the world of MPC that many of our listeners are maybe more familiar with? Well, one of the uh, big things we did with the Griffin Open Systems is uh, had sort of the advantage of hindsight of uh, you know what had gone wrong through the years, why our automation solutions not being adapted. And our viewpoint was that a lot of them became sort of monolithic type applications. You're building an application around solving one problem, or you have one algorithm and you're building a lot of code around that. Uh, with Griffin, we decided that the best way to go was focus on a toolkit for engineers mm -hmm. and uh, make it an open type design so that you can put any type of algorithm in, into the system. Focus on real time and reliability so that once you have a system up and running, you basically don't have to worry about ever compiling code, assembling code, but through a no code interface, you can now make easy application changes. So you're lowering the barriers to basically incorporating the engineers or operators knowledge into that solution. And so by having a more of a platform or a toolkit type setup, uh, it, it's a very different look than bring in, say, AI to a particular solution. So you now have one platform that can do many solutions versus a solution tailored to one specific problem. And it gives you a lot more flexibility. It makes it a lot easier to uh, support in the long term. Yeah, and you've, you've mentioned also that it's kind of agnostic so it's agnostic on the control layer but also to other enterprise systems where you may need to feed information or bring information in is that fair to say yes so yeah with the platform one of the key things was that we didn't want to kind of presume which vendor systems we're talking to even how many different vendor systems we're talking to uh, so the architecture is kind of a many to one one to many so you may be talking to a dcs system for uh, 
uh, certain regulatory control. You may be talking to PLCs on another area. You can talk to business systems that might be coming up with the goals that you'd really like to have incorporated uh, at the control layers. So it's agnostic in that you just need to have a means to getting the data flow and uh, you know certainly using many industry standard type links, OPC, Modbus, uh, et cetera, you can get the data in there and then send it out where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And with the open design, if somebody has proprietary uh, concepts or techniques, they just add them to the toolbar and then they can still use the same platform, but now they have their own unique uh, capability built into it. So we, we made it as open and essentially vendor agnostic as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think another maybe aspect to emphasize is the reliability and robustness, I think, that, that you've been striving for. Obviously, it's you're working in, in real time and, and closing real loops and doing things. And so that with your background, it's certainly in the nuclear and the power industry where uh, reliability is paramount. That's, that's certainly you've brought, brought that to the table as well. Yes, that, yeah, that definitely was sort of a uh, key design characteristic. There's nothing worse than being working on a system and then get the uh, blue screen of death type thing. <laughs> uh, so uh, our, our chief software architect uh, did a great job of tracking down a lot of the uh, little nuances that one runs across in the world. We design our system so that once you, I call it a boot and go, once you booted it, it should be able to run for years and you should never have to shut it down type of thing. And to me, that's part of the user satisfaction is not ever having to worry about that type of computer aspect. Yeah, so it's more more on the traditional OT model versus the IT world in that in that sense anyway. Yes, very much so. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this uh, term, adverent control that you use to, to describe what the toolkit enables. Can you explain a bit where that term came from and, and, and why you've chosen it? Yeah, the uh, term out of air control is something I came up with mostly because when talking to customers, I find they keep trying to either uh, put the platform into either the DCS bin or they put it onto the uh, OT bin of data analytics. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, got, got to come up with a way to try and differentiate the fact that we're really operating in the, the gray space between those layers. Mm -hmm. And so... I guess being an engineer, just kind of went back through the Latin and Greek and trying to find a word that was consistent and found something that was reasonably close to the out of errant, which just sounded nice. Uh -huh. And basically out of errant uh, is a loose root of, of the uh, the word assist. Okay. Uh, because what we're trying to do is assist the operators, make their lives easier, automate a lot of the mundane tasks that are distracting them from the main uh, job of when they're operating the units. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's an assistant to the uh, DCSs. You have your control curves in there, but the control curves are all based on, you know, sort of ideal assumptions. And so there needs to be continual fine tuning and biasing of the control system. Right. So we came up with the term out of errant because we're, we believe it's set up to assist operators on one side and assist the DCS on the other side. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of fits in that layer, uh, uh, the traditional layers on that Purdue model. Mm -hmm. So kind of kind of in between the levels two and three, more or less. Yes. Yeah. So what are the other adv specific advantages of having viewing resources at that spot uh, versus migrating them up or down the, the control pyramid? Well, the uh, large thing is that as we have more and more, uh, say, AI type of capabilities out there, uh, we find that the data analytics are great. But in general, it's a very limited value if you just analyze the data and you're not able to turn it into an actionable type of data, mm -hmm. such as being able to bias control system or arbitrate between uh, multiple goals or multiple mm -hmm. uh, islands of automation. And so it, it just fits better above the DCS. If you put it in the DCS, you have the challenges of all the uh, steps and risk associated with uh, modifying DCS controls. Mm -hmm. you know, the DCS is doing a great job on their regulatory control. They do a great job for their safety functions. It's kind of best just to let them do their thing. And so it's just kind of a natural fit to, to bridge tools on the OT side and uh, the uh, capabilities you have on the IT side. And it, it would certainly allow you to bridge if you had, say, DCSs from multiple vendors. Having it in the DCS would cause problems, we'll just say. Having it above yes. makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, yeah, well, that's, you know, kind of one interesting thing is that we just find being able to tie in, the, quite often it's like environmental uh, systems that are running on PLCs out there that are kind of just lost or forgotten about. And then we can bring those into the Griffin layer and then bring in other data coming in from the uh, the DCS and, you know, look at three or four different things. Quite often you can find that they're kind of chasing in circles. And uh, by putting us at that higher layer, we're able to look at all things simultaneously and quite often use the tools to come up with a, a good solution. Mm -hmm. So really bringing in data points that aren't maybe traditionally the, the closed loop data points, but things like environmental, other quality parameters and things like that, and being able to loop them in to optimize operations. Yes, and, and that's where yeah you get into some of the, you can add some nice uh, sophistication in the sense of, say you have an environmental solution and it's a 30-day rolling average. Well, it's right. kind of hard to put a 30-day rolling average into the DCS at the same time they're trying to control within the, you know, 30-second yeah. PID loop a uh, particular emission level. Uh -huh. And uh, by having this layer in here, we can either uh, tie into that 30-day rolling average or in many cases because of cybersecurity, you just sort of duplicate the look of that system and what the data is generated. But it's nice to know if you're going to be rolling off, you know, high values, low values types of things from uh, those systems. It mm -hmm. gives you a predictive capability that you wouldn't be able to put at the lower level. Uh, you're very explicitly, uh, you know, looking at the environmental constraints, keeping systems out of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can build up margin. And so instead of, oh, we're going to be running a new, uh, say, a fuel test in a couple of weeks and then dealing with the problem then, hey, build up some margin and, let the system, you know, automatically kind of put you in the position for a good, good test run. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. We focused quite a bit around optimization of control processes so far, but you've also talked about using the toolkit to automate on the operation side, the mundane <laughs> and repetitive so that operators can focus on more value adding tasks. Can you describe maybe a few use cases of this sort and, and the benefits delivered? Uh, sure. I, I think we'll probably pick on sort of the emission and, and process interaction side again. Uh, so uh, one particular process, they are dealing with opacity alarms. So they have a, a emission limit on opacity. They can't exceed it. Mm -hmm. And it'll actually go into alarm if it's high for uh, six minutes. Right. And so this is for a mercury control uh, process, and they're putting pack injection in. Problem is, as you increase pack, you increase opacity. So it might help your mercury emissions, but you're not helping your pack emissions. Right. And uh, for the operator, it, in some degree, it's easy. Okay, I have an opacity alarm. I'm just going to trim back on my pack injection. Problem is, if they keep trimming back on that, eventually they get the mercury alarm. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, then they might take another action. Overall, those are really kind of simple tasks. They're just kind of adding, subtracting here and there. And it's we call it somewhat of a mundane activity. It's it's not it's not like it's uh, rocket science. So opacity is high. I need to do this. This is low. I need to do that. But we can build that decision tree in there, and then also build in a little more intelligence of just exactly how much adjustment needs to be made. It's a nonlinear process, mm -hmm. and the nonlinear process is affected by uh, weather. It's affected by your fuel stock. Uh, there's a lot of nuances in there that. Even though it's a simple task for the operator, it's hard for them to figure out. So we can just put a little decision tree in there, combine it with a little more analytics, combine it with basically looking at those 30-day averages. And now it's doing all those little tweaks both ahead of time because it can anticipate opacity as it's coming up. Mm -hmm. You have things like, say, soot blowing that cause an opacity spike. If you know a soot blower is about to run, you take a preemptive action. Um, so the operator doesn't have to worry about taking that preemptive action. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, uh, when you put in a few simple rules, combine it with a couple of predictive models, basically that opacity or mercury control system just becomes something that's running in the background and something that they used to do 10, 15, 20 tweaks during the day. Now they have to do none. So right. it's, it's a big savings, and that's where we uh, get back to it being an assistance to the operator. That particular application sounds a lot like the the promise of the, the neural networks that we were talking about 20 years ago and being <laughs> a lot, lot yes. easier to implement, perhaps. Well, actually, and part of it is an outgrowth of that because with one of the biggest challenges of the neural nets is it, there's a strong tendency to let the neural net do everything. Mm -hmm. And one of our mantras is, 
it's just something that's a simple if and but type rule. Just put it in like that and make the life of the neural net much easier. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where you start to get better acceptance of the systems because it does things much more uh, deterministic where you expect it to be deterministic. And then the, the neural net can do the uh, fancy stuff when you're trying to do a hundred dimensional uh, uh, optimization question. I suppose that makes sense. Use the, use the right tool for the, for the challenge. So when it, when it comes to gauging return on investment, can you describe how users of yours have justified engaging with you on projects, but then also the feedback that you've gotten from them once they've put the toolkit, toolkit to work and are up and running? What's the feedback then? Well, it's kind of interesting because to sell you know, pretty much any product or service, they're, they're always looking at the return on investment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, our customers uh, quite often are looking at, okay, what's our savings on fuel usage? What's our savings on heat rate or some process consumable? So that they're, you know, basically trying to find that dollar savings, which is a reduction in something being used mm -hmm. or an increase in the overall efficiency of the process. Sure. So you, you cross that hurdle and then you get into the process installation side and then uh, using the platform and the toolkit now you are fine tuning. You're trying to basically uh, do knowledge capture from their smartest operators. Uh, mm -hmm. To some degree, I suppose that could be considered cheating, but the first thing you want to do is talk to that senior operator that <laughs> yeah. knows how to, how to run the plant best Absolutely. and get that knowledge into the system and then you talk to the engineers and say well what has what has been driving you crazy for the last couple of years or you know why why are you constantly having to go into the control room and you deal with those issues which may or may not necessarily be directly related to your uh, roi right but they are directly related to the uh, acceptance in the long term gotcha. and you remove all those little nuances kind of getting back to automating some of those you know the mundane and in doing so, uh, the, the feedback after the fact is generally what they are happiest about is the fact that life is easier for the operators and life is easier for the uh, engineers, that they actually have a reduction in their time on things that they used to find very frustrating mm -hmm. and allows them to use their skill sets on uh, sort of higher order type problems and moving on to, to some degree, of the uh, process of continual improvements because their mind is freed up now to work on on new activities so that that savings in you know their time and unburdening of the task i would say by far is after the fact the, the biggest positive from these types of projects mm -hmm. so it's maybe not the most quantitative thing you can estimate in advance but once it's up and in place they're finding new use cases and applying it in yeah in multiple different areas yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good point because that's you know it'd be nice to be able to sell it on that, but uh, there's no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's extremely difficult to uh, quantify uh, th those savings. But once it's up, it, they speak for themselves, huh? Yes, they do, and and it is nice because then uh, then you have the champions in the house because they know if they do the next thing, their life gets better on, on the next project, and uh, you know management's happy because they're getting their ROIs. Yeah. Well, great. Well, certainly wish you and the, the rest of the team there, Griffin, uh, continued success and continued success for your customers, obviously, as well. Really, thank you also for taking the time to share your, your insights with us today. Well, thank you very much for your time, and thank you again for the uh, invite. You bet. For those of you listening, thanks also for tuning in today, and thanks also to Griffin Open Systems for sponsoring this Solution Spotlight episode. I'm Keith Larson, and you've been listening to a Control Amplified podcast. Thanks for joining us. And if you've enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe at the iTunes store and at Google Podcasts. Plus, you can find the full archive of past episodes at controlglobal.com. Signing off until next time. Thanks again, Brad, for joining us.